What's up guys, Coach Steve here and welcome back to another episode of the Rise Podcast, episode, episode number two of the Rise Podcast. And for the first time in a really long time, I'm going to be hosting this podcast all by myself. So yes, Co- Coach Nick uh, caught up with a few other projects today, Goodness wasn't able to make our recording. So Coach Steve on his own for Rise episode number two, Rise Podcast episode number two. And geez, it feels strange not being able to look at someone else while I'm talking at them or look at myself. You know, when we're recording on Zoom, I can see myself. Uh, So this is a bit strange talking into the ether, but stick with me. We're going on a little bit of a journey as we go through episode number two of the Rise Method podcast. Now, it's been a while since I've done these uh, episodes solo. There's been uh, about 150 or so episodes I've done with Coach Nick or with another guest, Um, but there has been a few episodes in the past, but you've surely seen some videos of me just talking uh, into the camera or talking into the ether, so you probably know what to expect. Now, before we kind of get into it, I would like to give one shameless plug to the RISE method. Just one shameless plug to the RISE method saying that the RISE method challenge, the very first RISE method challenge starts on June the 12th. It's only 50 bucks for 10 weeks. You get a training plan, nutrition plan, which are really cool. I've been spending lots of time um, upgrading those uh, spreadsheets into something that's really, truly something uh, really amazing. We have three different training programs, Team Fit, Team Build, and Team Strong, depending on what goal you want to uh, aim for. Team Fit, of course, trying to be fit. Team Strong, trying to get strong. And Team Build, trying to build some muscle. And then we have our meal plan. So not necessarily a nutrition plan, a meal plan, because what it does is it calculates how many calories you need and then provides you with meals. So that includes the uh, ingredients of the meal, the, the recipe of the meal, and the name of the meal. Um, and you can freely swap from meal to meal. So, you know, a chicken stir fry to a, you know, beef schnitzel um, to spaghetti bolognese, all really seamlessly inside of the spreadsheet. And then you can also change individual food items, all scale to your nutritional needs as well. So really cool programs. You get access to the forum, uh, exclusive forum um, in our membership area and a social hub in the membership area. And there's loads of conversation happening already. And some of those questions we'll be answering um, a little bit later in this podcast. And I'll give you a little bit of a, a Coach Steve voice answer to some of the questions that have come up on the forum already. And of course, we have the All Stars Celebration, which I want to take a moment to explain to you right now. There are a, a few of you out there, um, you know, unsure about the All Star Celebration. What is it? I don't get it. Don't don't quite understand. Is it just a popularity contest? And my answer is no. You know, we're really particular with the words that we're using and trying to match the overall purpose of the Rise Method. Now, talking about the Rise Method, you know, even down to our logo, it's circular. It's all about continuous br- growth and the idea that fitness is a, a cycle, right? It's not something that, you know, has a start and end point and something that is with us forever, right? It's, it's a part of our lives. So instead of having a competition where we have a, a start date and an end date and we celebrate the people who've done, you know, a good job over X amount of time, we want to have a celebration, not a competition, a celebration for uh, those who are active in our community, those who have pursuits towards improving their deep health, and those who have pursuits to improving their strength and getting strong. So we're celebrating five people each and every week. Now, the weekly part of it is really important because instead of focusing on like, you know, 10 week challenge, and then if you stuck with it for 10 weeks, you know, you could win a prize, you know, you might fall off the wagon in week one or week two, your, your kid gets sick, there's a work deadline, you know, you're struggling financially or socially, whatever's going on. You might not be able to train for two or three weeks and then you kind of put your hands up in the air and go, ah, it's over, I'll wait until the next challenge starts. Hey, you can you can start right at that day again, you know, week four or week five or week six or whatever it is, and you could still win um, in part of the All-Stars celebration. So we're going to be picking five people each week and they're going to be winning a booster pack to the value of about $200. So part of that will be refunding your entry fee so you can have a free challenge on us. And then the rest of the pack, about $150 worth, will be a bunch of other goodies so that you can keep on rising. So all you need to do is engage in the community so you can post on our forum, like many of you are, asking questions, posting your wins, celebrating and, and commenting on each other's posts, uh, maybe posting in the social hub and commenting on each other's posts. So engaging the community, number one. Number two is to post about your 
um, transformation in your health. So how you might be improving your health. That could be how you're eating nutritious food or, you know, trying to not stress on a particular day or maybe practicing some meditation or going for a hike um, or, you know, just being, you know, improving yourself on a, on a healthy level. Um, and then number three is posting about how you're improving your strength and getting stronger. So that could be going to the gym, posting a PB, um, you know, how you're exercising and improving your strength. So those are the three criteria, engaging with the community, telling us your story about improving deep health and telling us your story about how you are, you know, improving your strength. So that doesn't mean that you need to post selfies every day on the Facebook group. No, 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 no. You don't, you don't need to be Mr. or Mrs. Popular on you know, Instagram or have a million followers. No, no, no. That's not the point. The point is to celebrate our all-stars. Five people each week will be celebrated and maybe we'll get them on the podcast or we'll talk about them on the podcast. Um, we'll post them on our website, post them on social media. We'll celebrate those individuals. And then next week, we'll celebrate our next round of all-stars. And it might be someone you inspire to be. I want to be an all-star something that you work towards and improve. And that's essentially what the, the moral morale of Rise Method is, is about consistent improvement of ourselves. Okay, but that's the only plug that I'm going to make for the, the Rise Method. And I'd like to spend a little bit of time in this podcast answering some um, common questions or maybe some interesting questions that have come up across the forum um, or on um, social media like our Facebook social hub. Okay, so the first question actually comes from the Facebook group. It comes from Bridie. And Bridie asks verbatim, question exclamation mark. If I'm going for a heavier weight on a certain exercise, should I go for as many as I can on the new weights, i.e. six to seven reps, and then drop the weight to the original weight to make up for 10 to 12 reps, or just finish it on the heavy weight and maybe do an extra set? Okay. So a little bit to unpack with um, maybe a few assumptions on what Bridey might be referring to, okay? So let's look at that second part where she goes to make up the 10 to 12 reps, 10 to 12 rep, rep range. Backpedal, what is a rep range? A rep range is a target of reps we're trying to aim for with the load that we're using. The reason why we have a range like 10 to 12 reps rather than just 10 or just 12 is that if we are at the higher end of our rep range, let's say 12 reps, uh, that's when it can be indicated that we increase the load. So let's say you can do 10 kilos for 12 reps. You can increase the weight to, let's say, 12 and a half kilos. That's often the next progression up from 10 kilos. And we want to be finding a load that maybe we're at the bottom end of the range, maybe 10 reps. So maybe you could do, follow with me, 10 kilos for 12 reps, or you can do 12 and a half kilos for 10 reps. So you would increase the load and you do 10 reps at 12 and a half kilos until you could do maybe 11 reps, do you do 12 reps and then you rinse and repeat. So it's a simple progression model. A model doesn't always mean that it's uh, accurate, true and something that we have to be hard and fast on. It's just a way that we can measure progression, okay? Now, Bridie has mentioned that she wants to move up in weight and she is only able to hit maybe six or seven reps and then she wants to drop the weight down to the original weight and then make up the 10 to 12 reps. So this is the first assumption that we need to address that the magic number of 10 to 12 reps isn't a, a magic number. It's not like this 10 to 12 reps or eight to 12 reps or 10 reps or 20 reps or five reps or whatever the number is. It's not a magic number that we need to hit um, to elicit any significant response. When it comes to building muscle, which we're gonna assume that this question is around building muscle. When it comes to building muscle, the reps that we do don't really matter too much as long as it's within a, uh, a reasonable range. So anywhere between about five repetitions, upwards about 30 repetitions is appropriate for building muscle, okay? Anything lower than or fewer than five reps, we probably face some problems with uh, fatigue management and this concept called axial loading. So let's say you go to do a squat at a three rep max, that's a lot of compression like pushing us down compressing the, the spine and stuff, and that could add to layers of fatigue. So you usually load less than five reps, uh, you know, too heavy to be dealing with. Um, and then anything beyond 30 repetitions is just too fatiguing. You know, if I'm doing bicep curls and I'm grabbing the two kilo dumbbells and I'm at rep number 20, rep number 30, rep number 40, rep number 50, I'm, I'm standing there now for like two or three minutes doing bicep curls. Ah, uh, like it's not very productive, you know? So anywhere between five to 30 repetitions um, is appropriate for building muscle, as long as they are challenging 
sets, they're challenging sets, meaning that we're getting close to failure for the target muscle, okay? Challenging sets close to failure for the target muscle. Now, if we think of something like a bicep curl, we all know how to do a bicep curl, you bend the elbow. But sometimes when you go to bend the elbow, as we get fatigued, we might bend the elbow and swing the arm in front of us, turning it into a bit of like a, a, a frontal raise. You know, you see those bro and broettes, how they swing their arm around. Um, or maybe when we curl, we actually bring the elbow behind our body. Yeah. So we take the arm into a bit of extension while we're taking the elbow into flexion. So the elbow is going behind the body as we bend the elbow. And that actually makes the movement a little bit easier. So you might find rep number five, six, seven is, you know, good quality bicep curl targeting the bicep, but then rep number eight, nine, 10 turn into something a little bit different where you change the exercise slightly to get more reps out and you might be recruiting other muscles. Okay. That's when it gets iffy where we go, all right, yeah, you, you, you might've done too many reps actually, because you've recruited other muscles and it's no longer a bicep curl. It's a different name of an exercise now. But I digress. So the main takeaway is that we want to be choosing a load that is challenging, that we train close to failure for the target muscle. So in this example, for Bridie, she does not need to do five, uh, sorry, six to seven reps and then drop the weight and then get herself up to the 10 to 12 rep range. She can simply use the new weight and then go for that rep range of like, you know, six to seven reps, stick with that new weight over a period of time. Um, until she's able to maybe get that eighth rep out, that ninth rep out, then maybe in like a month or so, she might be able to get her 10 reps out on this new weight, and then she rinse and repeats. Just like the rise method in a circular fashion, it's about continuous growth, right? The final point she's made is about, do I maybe add an extra set? Do I add an extra set? And that's a way that we can add more volume is we add another set, and that is a progression tool. So if you can't add more reps into a weight and you can't, increase the load, then yes, we can increase the um, sets that we do to increase the total volume load. So that is one progression tool. And there are some programs where maybe you do, you know, two sets in week one, three sets in week two, four sets in week three, and then maybe five sets in week four, and then you deload and then you repeat. So across the meso cycle, you might progress through increasing total volume rather than increasing the total um weight that you lift. So it's just another variable that we can scale. Okay. Um, it gets a few more spanners thrown in the works when we consider the big picture of training where we go, okay, if I'm doing three or four or five exercises in a day, and then I'm going to add another set in, um, that's, you know, an extra couple of minutes here and there of each set that I do. Plus I've got to recover from those sets. Is it better to maybe do a few more reps as a way of progressing? Cause that takes a few seconds or maybe add a little bit extra load uh, and not increase any time, is that a, a better way to progress logically than it is um, to battle the logistical challenge of adding more sets, okay? But some things to consider when progressing. The final point I wanna make about broadly about progression is the concept of progressive overload. And that's thrown around a few times. And I had a, a couple of folk actually mention to me via emails when they were asking questions about what program do I choose, which is the next question here. And they would say things like, oh, I do progressive overload in my training. And that's nice. You know, you do progressive overload. I think we all do some form of progressive overload. Um, but it's not, progressive overload isn't necessarily a, a method of training. It's a principle of training, right? And those two words is actually more so just the single word, which is overload. Because whenever we're training, we should be training at a level where we are applying overload, where something is challenging. And that overload over time doesn't become overload, it just becomes load, right? It just becomes something that's that's easy. You may remember in your own fitness journey where you might have struggled to, you know, bicep curl five kilos, and then now, you know, you're looking at the 20 kilo barbell or dumbbell or however strong you are, and that's, you know, your new challenging number, right? So our overload needs to increase over time as we get stronger, as we adapt to that load. And that happens in a progressive fashion. So it's called progressive overload, but the principle is just overload. So by saying something like, I do progressive overload, you know, um, that's something that we should all be doing. We should all be applying overload. Um, and the load that we do does not does not need to be progressive, right? And what I mean by that is that each week, you don't need to expect that you 
add five kilos to the bar or do another rep or do another set. It's, that expectation uh, is false. And you may find that you gain better results through maintaining more variables. So instead of trying to do more reps and more weight for the sake of doing more reps and more weight, you stick with the load that you did previously or the reps that you did previously, you just aim for that, what you did previously. And over time, as you get more efficient at your technique, your execution, um, you may get a better experience with, you know, DOMS and the pump and a better stimulus on the muscle that you're doing. And for some folk out there who are more advanced, as you progress with a new exercise, you actually start to decrease the weight slightly because you get better at executing that exercise. Yeah. And I've experienced this when I first... Um, well, not first, when I reintroduced hack squats into my training um, about 12 months ago, before I was more training in a, in a gym, after, uh, more training at home after welcoming my second son. Now, um, going back to the hack squat, you know, load up 100 kilos, happy days, you know, you could do hack squats. But then as I got better at hack squats and found out the position of my feet and going a little bit deeper and slowing the lowering phase, get that stretch at the bottom of the hack squat, I needed to decrease the load on the hack squat so I can continue to get good reps in. So I needed to decrease the load down to 80 kilos instead of 100 kilos. And I was able just to match my reps and I was hopping off the machine like a baby gazelle, like I couldn't walk, you know? So interesting ideas as we become more advanced and we are able to execute exercises better. And when we go to exercise uh, different movements, um, often what happens is when we are reintroduced to an exercise that we haven't done for a while, it might take a few weeks just to kind of remember that exercise. So I haven't done hack squats in you know a few months now. So if I go to do a hack squat, depending on where I am um, and what type of machine it is, because you know different brand of machines, you know feel a little bit different. It might take a few weeks for me to kind of remember, refeel the hack squat machine, and then I progress through that. So that's a new stimulus that I apply, and to continue to see progress, I need to actually decrease the load. But I digress. That was a little rant about overload and progression, um, and I hope you found that interesting. So next question here, or next discussion point, is talking about programs. Um, what program do I choose? And then it's going to lead into maybe a little bit more of um, a periodized type conversation about how do I periodize a program. So many folk out there coming and joining the RISE method, unsure about what program to choose. So when we think program for the sake of this conversation, we're thinking about the training program. And we have three training programs. Team Fit, all about fitness, getting fit, improving your cardiovascular fitness. Team Build, all about building muscle. And Team Strong, all about gaining strength. So Team Strong is all about, we've got barbells, we're lifting weights, and we're training at low rep ranges um, and trying to increase you know, our one rep max. That's the goal. Team Build, we're slowly progressing um, total volume that we have on our muscles, and we're trying to stimulate muscle growth. And then Team Fit, uh, a little bit more um, circuit-based training to challenge our cardiovascular system so we can improve, improve our fitness. Now, depending on what goal you have um, can help dictate what program we choose. And then also a little bit of personal preference. So if you hate running around, jumping, uh, doing circuit style training, maybe Team Fit isn't for you, right? Um, if you don't have access to a barbell, you've never lifted heavy weights before, um, maybe Team Strong, you might not be ready for, for that. Maybe you spend a bit of time, maybe doing something like Team Build, practice, your barbell works that when you go into team strong and you see barbell back squats and barbell bench presses, you have a little bit of experience with those exercises, right? So we've got the goal and then maybe our personal preference. They're the two things that kind of dictate us towards what where we go. So some folks out there um, are really eager to continue to lose body fat, but then also want to build muscle. So they want the best of both worlds. Now, unfortunately, the most effective way to lose muscle, uh, to lose body fat is through dieting, um, and that is to consume less food than we expend, or consume fewer units of energy than we expend, or in other ways, where we're consuming fewer calories than we expend, okay? Because calories are how we me measure energy. So the most effective way to lose 
weight to lose body fat is to eat at an energy deficit or also called a calorie deficit. Now, the most efficient way to build muscle is to eat in a food surplus or an energy surplus or a calorie surplus. And this is because when we're building muscle, we're growing more tissue. So we need more supplies, right? You know, more proteins in our body and more units of energy so that we can build more muscle mass and more bone mass and to um, fuel our performance. So we need extra fuel. So when we look at one goal, which is fat loss, and one goal, which is muscle gain, the most effective ways to achieve those two things are the complete opposite of each other, right? You can't be at an energy deficit and an energy surplus at the same time. Now you might be thinking, well, Steve, what about if I go in the middle? What if I try to not be an energy surplus or an energy deficit? I try to balance my calories exactly, right? And that is a strategy that people do, and they call that recomposition. And you'll probably see some folk out there where they would post like their before and afters over you know two or three years and you would see a really nice transformation. Great, recomposition, it's a thing. The problem with recomposition is that you need to work really, really hard to try to do both, right? You need to work really hard to try to lose some body fat and gain some muscle. Everything needs to be perfect uh, and it takes a really long time, right? It's like if you were renovating your house, you know, you've got your bathroom, you want to renovate it, yeah? Um, you could either pull things out of the bathroom, right? You're, you're ripping off the tiles, ripping out the bathtub, ripping out the sink, um, or you could be adding to the bathroom, you know, putting in a new bathtub and a new sink. But trying to do both, like on the same day or the same time, you know, you've got things coming out, things coming in and everything like that. It's chaos, right? It, it, things can take a really long time. There's more problems can come up. I'm going to probably take a, a much longer for the entire project to get done. If you were to think about the project, all right, I'm going to set my, my bathroom renovation. It might take, you know, a few days to clear everything out and then, you know, a week or two to kind of reinstall everything. Great. It's over. It's done. Rather than trying to get, you know, a tradesman to come in to try to pull everything out while well, you've got the plumber there and a tiler there and everything's to try to put everything back in the same time. Ah, we've seen, we've seen the block. It's chaos, right? Another example I've used often is the idea of um, learning languages. So if you take two languages that are very different, let's say for this example, German and Arabic, you wanted to learn two different languages, you would probably be better focusing on just one language at a time. So let's say six months learning German and then six months learning Arabic rather than trying to learn both German and Arabic uh, at the same time over, let's say, 12 months, you know, six months German, six months Arabic, or do both at the same time for 12 months. At the end of that 12 month period, you're probably more proficient at each language if you did one at a time rather than trying to do both. Okay, so at the end of the day, um, within the RISE method, that circular idea, fitness is for life, we've got time, you know, we can definitely do both. Okay, we just need to decide on what is more pertinent to us at this moment, right? What's more important to us. So if you are putting your hand up saying, well, Steve, I've got X amount of kilos that I'd like to lose for whatever reason, and we're not going to get into the reasons why you'd like to lose weight, but each to our own, if you'd like to lose X amount of kilos, that's fine. Um, and that's your primary goal. Great. Let's focus on trying to lose that weight. If your goal is to develop your physique, okay. Then we can ask more questions. All right, develop your physique. That means you want to build some muscle and you want to lose some weight. All right, what 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 should we do next? To answer that question, we actually need to look at our history. So if you've been dieting for, let's say, three months, six months, 12 months, you've been dieting for three or six or 12 months or anything more than three months, if you've been dieting for anything more than three months, it's probably not a good not a good idea to continue to diet. Okay, you probably want to go through a process of maintenance where you're trying to maintain your body weight for a little bit, have a little bit of a break from dieting um, or transition into a, a muscle building phase or a weight gaining phase. Okay. However, if you've been maintaining for quite some time or maybe building for quite some time or you just really done nothing, you haven't really maintained or gained or lost or anything like that, you're brand new to all of this. Um, and your goal is to weight loss, great. Weight loss is your goal. And I would actually argue that if you haven't been doing anything, you've probably been cruising around maintenance because um, our body has a really interesting way to kind of find balance. It's not this super linear, you know, increase of body weight over time. Um, it's often driving factors in our, in our environment that increase our weight in, in steps, in steps rather than just a linear line. Um, so for example, me, I've been cruising 
at about 100 kilos for, for quite some time, and there's, there's some ebbs and flows, um, but that is where my body likes to sit. And as I progressively get a little bit stronger, you know, I might not be gaining lots of muscle, but that's where I kind of cruise. If you look at someone who might not be interested in fitness, maybe you've got a friend, family member, coworker, something like that, not interested in fitness, they probably look the similar way for quite some time. You know, they've, they've had the same body weight for quite some time, but it's when we have things happen in our lives, like, you know, change of job or maybe um, changing behaviors. You've got like a, a new TV, new couch, so you're sitting down more. It's winter time. You're not walking as much. You're not going outside and those types of incidental activities. That's when things like weight gain occur, not as just a, a general thing that happens in life over time. It's usually a, uh, a reflection of our environment. <clears throat> but I digress. So we're talking about choosing programs. It really comes down to what your ultimate goal is and then reflecting on your history, where you've come from. Now, when it comes to periodizing our programs, so let's say you want to lose weight, how long should you try to lose weight for? There is a little bit of a range where we can start to say, mm, that's probably a good idea. So anything less than six weeks of true dieting and true dieting where we're losing weight I would define that as losing weight at a rate of about 0.5 to 1% per week. That's kind of like tick, you are losing weight. So if you are tick, losing weight, tick, you're on a diet, tick, um, then how long should you be doing that for? Anything less than six weeks, anything less than six weeks, I would say that it's not enough time to see any significant change. It might take a couple of weeks for you just to kind of transition into a new diet and get into that diet mindset. You know, that's week one, week two, week three. You haven't really started collecting enough data to determine if it is has been successful because, you know, weeks one, two, three is mainly um, water weight changes and those types of things. So we would want to be dieting for at least six weeks as a minimum, right? And then on the other side of it, I would say that we don't want to be dieting for any more than about 12 weeks. So after 12 weeks, after three months of dieting, tick true dieting, tick where we're losing about 0.5 to 1% of our body weight per week percentage. Um, anything more than 12 weeks, that's when we risk things like fatigue, risk things like mood swings. That's when we get problems with maintaining our diet and we can um, you know, start to look at food a different way. That's when we probably need a little bit of a break. And some of us, you know, real die hard, you know, we're strong and you know, you, you, you power on through it. You could diet for a little bit longer than that, but anything after 12, that's when I'll be getting ready to wrap up a, a dieting phase. If you turn around and go, Steve, well, geez, I've been dieting for 12 months. Maybe not the definition of dieting. Maybe you've been losing weight at ebbs and flows because you've changed your environment, similar to my example before, where, I don't know, it's winter time, so you don't exercise as much, so you gain some weight. You might be doing the opposite direction. So you've done some step changes where as you slowly changed your environment, that change in your environment led to an extra couple of kilos to be decreased and lost. And that could be that you, it's now summertime, you go for walks, or maybe you've got a dog, so you're taking a dog for a walk, or maybe you've got a gym membership now, you go to the gym, or maybe on the weekend, instead of going and getting um, pot and parlor night with the boys, you um, you know have a home-cooked meal and that, that type of behavior. So those kind of step changes downwards can lead to long-term changes over 12 months. And for some of us, that's all we need to do to lose some great great weight. Um, but a more structured approach might be something like losing weight at a rate of 0.5 to 1%. So weight loss about six to 12 weeks is what I recommend. You can go more than that if you truly believe you're a diehard, but you probably benefit and it might be more strategic to cease the diet and maybe transition into a maintenance phase. Maintenance defined as you're no longer losing weight or gaining weight, just cruising where you are. But on the flip side, if your goal is to build some muscle, which kind of segues into the final question or almost final question that we have about bulking. If your goal is to build some muscle, strategically, similarly to our weight loss goal, we want to be trying to gain weight or trying to build muscle for a minimum of about six weeks. Again, because anything smaller than that is just too short to, to see any significant change. When we think about the true structural changes of muscles, uh, you know, we're looking at around this like eight week mark for muscles to change really early on, let's say about the four to six week mark, that's when we get some really good nervous system changes where our nerves get better and we get stronger through our nervous system. 
But for a true muscle adaptation, gosh, you know, eight, 10 weeks is where like muscles structurally start to change, right? So we want to be trying to build muscle for at least six weeks. Then on the flip side, um, you know, we want to be trying to build muscle at most around this like 18 week mark, 18 week mark, uh, a little bit more than 12 weeks because we can um, gain weight a little bit longer than that. Um, anything longer than 18 weeks, that's when we start to face problems like, you know, we might be gaining a little bit too much body fat, um, might have problems with stimulus of the of the exercise or maybe problems with deloading if we are in an energy surplus. Um, and we might be having some challenges with our health at that stage if we are continuing to gain weight. Because what we recommend is a weight gain rate of about 0.5 to 1% of your body weight per month. So if we're looking at 18 weeks, that's like four and a half months. So we could be gaining, you know, four or 5% of our body weight, which might be enough to be like, oh, geez, okay, you know, it's a bit hard to get upstairs these days and that type of thing, depending on how big you are, right? So that's when we should be wrapping up our diet. Um, and then transitioning in, into either maintenance phase or a weight loss phase. So that's how we can kind of structure our program where we might do every like six to 12 weeks, we transition from, um, you know, weight loss to weight gain, right? More long-term over 12 months, you might go, you know, weight loss, maintenance, weight gain, maintenance, weight loss, right? So we're try, trying to do these ebbs and flows of structured um, gaining muscle phases or weight gaining phases and structured weight loss phases, yeah? The weight loss phases should be smaller than the weight gain phases because if we gain, let's say at most 1% of our body weight per month over four months, that's 4% of our body weight, we could lose you know 1% of our body weight per week. So that 4% that we gained, we might be able to lose that 4% that we gained in just four weeks rather than four months. So we can lose weight at a much quicker rate and the weight loss is often first, you know, body fat, and then more long-term starts to be muscle mass that we're losing. And then weight gain um, is a bit harder because at first we start to, you know, start to deposit a little bit of body fat and then kind of like the muscle starts to catch up with that there. So we need to be okay with um, some muscle loss when we're dieting and we need to be okay with some fat gain while we're building muscle. Which leads me into the next question here. We've had a few questions about the concept of bulking on the forum. A few questions about the concept of bulking and... I want to address kind of the language that's used with bulking. And firstly, the term and word bulking, what is it, or bulking, what does that mean? And that often has preconceived ideas about what that means. So bulking is when people are referring to that muscle building phase where we're trying to gain weight and get bulked up. But what other language is used when we're bulking, some individuals who are anxious about gaining body fat, don't want to gain body fat, even though body fat happens every day. You know, we gain body fat, lose body fat. It happens, you know, every minute, every day as we as we go through our physiological processes is that words like, I don't want to undo my hard work by bulking, right? I don't want to, I'm, yeah, mainly that, that line. I don't want to undo my hard work. That always gets thrown in to the con conversation of, of bulking. Personally, understand that you're not undoing any hard work. Bulking is, is essentially eating in an energy surplus. And what happens when we're in an energy surplus is we have excess energy, which we use for life. And that excess energy, at first, we hope that you channel towards performance, which is why on the meal plan, we specifically use that language where if you wanted to gain weight, it's the performance setting because you are eating for performance. So eating the extra food, having the extra energy, you are able to perform better. And if you perform better, you can stimulate more muscle, stimulate more muscle, we get more muscle growth. And then secondary fact, more energy, more growth, right? So think of it like performance. If we are going through a weight gaining phase, we're going through performance. The word bulking sometimes has this negative image to it. Like I'm going to get chubby, I'm going to get fat, I'm going to get bulked up. And, you know, we don't want to look, we have, uh, you know, beliefs in ourselves. We don't look, we don't want to look like that. We might want, don't want to look chubby. We don't want to look fat, don't, those types of things. So it comes with anxieties. Oh, I don't want to eat an energy surplus because I'm going to look like what I was before. You're forgetting that you're not who you were before. You know, you're someone who exercises now, someone who lifts weights. And by eating an energy surplus while you're lifting weight, whew, you will get thick, right? Your muscles will grow. You will change your physique. And often 
when people have goals like, oh, I want to lose five kilos because I want to look like, show me this picture, and they bring up some, you know, Instagram model or someone. To achieve that goal, it's not actually about losing five kilos. If anything, it's maybe gaining five kilos to look like that, right? Because you need some more muscle on you. So um, don't be afraid to move through that muscle building phase. And Coach Nick and I speak about this a lot on the, the challenge podcast previously to the Rise podcast. But don't be afraid to go through that period of, of gaining weight. Be cautious of the language you use because that has preconceived ideas to it. Or oh, I'm bulking, you know, okay, what does that mean? Oh, I'm going to get chubby. I'm going to get fat. Oh, I don't want to go backwards. All right, we're not going backwards. We're moving forwards. And you may find that going through a period of muscle gaining, a muscle gaining phase, you build more muscle, your metabolism as defined as your energy expenditure increases because you need more energy to maintain that muscle. Like me, 100 kilos coach Steve, I need probably a bit more energy than, you know, coach Nick, who's a little bit smaller than I am. So I can eat more food than she does because I need more uh, energy to maintain that. Okay. So be confident about gaining muscle, be confident about going through this new phase. And I will say it is more challenging because when we are going through a weight gain phase, it's not about just simply eating more food. It's about becoming obsessed with training and constantly, consistently improving our training. And often when people join things like the challenge or the rise method, the first comments they'll make, oh no, my training's fine. It's all my nutrition. And I would question that. And I say that because I've, I've watched a lot of people train, I've watched a lot of people move, and we could all find ways to improve our execution. And even pro, pro bodybuilders, just like a sports athlete, will watch videos of themselves training, how do I get better, how do I get better? And you watch any aftermatch um, review of any professional sports team, what do they do? They're sitting there, they're watching their performance, right? They're looking at ways to improve, and these are professional athletes. So if you're sitting there thinking, ah, oh, Steve, no, 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 my training's perfect, it's all my nutrition, it's equal. It needs to be equal between training and nutrition. If anything, you're trying to build muscle, you need to be leaning more towards training. You need to find ways to improve your training. And that could be to film yourself, watch yourself reflect. That might be to go slower with your movements. That might be to add more load, train closer to failure. That'd be to feel the stretch, feel the pump, experiment with new exercises, um, advanced training techniques, you name it. Uh, there's always ways that we can get better with our training in the gym and then our training outside the gym. What I mean by that is those things that facilitate good training, like sleep, stress, you know, quality of nutrition to help with our, our training, um, these things that help to get us in the gym and performing well, okay? Now, finally, I want to talk about one question or comment from Fletcher. Fletcher, uh, long-term uh, challenger, and we love Fletcher here, He's always working hard to improve himself. And Fletcher writes to us, what I want and what I like don't match, okay? And he writes, hey, Coach Steve, you've seen me around a little bit and I'm really grateful for you. Thank you, Fletcher. I'm grateful for you too, my friend. My problem right now is I'm very limited for time. The next six months, maybe, I can make time at the cost of sleep, family time. I really love lifting weights, but give me an upper body days and I can spend hours moving that weight around. So the problem is I want to be fit. I want to be able to run around, go on hikes and be able to handle loads when I eventually start my family, but seeing that team build work out routine, oh boy, that's got me wanting to be in the gym, pulling some cables and throwing weights, which just naturally feels good to me. Um, it'd be so much easier if I could just afford to pimp out my home gym as well. I appreciate any advice you have or anyone else as well. I'm open to any advice. So Fletcher's kind of talking about maybe being a little bit time poor. He wants to be fit. So maybe he wants to kind of think about joining team fit but he really loves team build because he loves to throw around some weights and doesn't know what to do because going to the gym can be hard because you know the logistical time yeah you're in the gym for 30 minutes 45 minutes an hour but you've got you know that 10 15 minute drive to the gym to hop out of your car walk in the gym hide to the person at the reception and go in and put your bag down whatever you're doing and then you go in a train like it, it adds up right the fluff time adds up and an hour gym session can easily turn into two hours of out of the house time. And when I think about my own situation and I've got two young boys under two, my time to train is once everyone's asleep because I don't want to leave my, my partner, Laura, just in charge of two crazy kids running around. So once everyone's like nap time during the day, that's when I love to go and train. Um, in the evening, I'm just too gassed 
to think about training. So I love to train in that window of time, maybe an hour, an hour and a half. So if I was to go to the, the gym, uh, you know, I'm losing half an hour just to like drive there and drive back before my, my boys wake up. So I had to train in my home garage. And yeah, that means I miss out on some of the toys in the gym, but we make two. Now, similar to Fletcher, when I go and train, I am pretty tired, right? I've got a few projects on the go. You know, it, it is tough being a parent. I know many parents out there, but when I do go and train, my my brain's often elsewhere. You know, I'm thinking about, oh, geez, I've got to record this podcast later today and I've got to update a spreadsheet. I'm going to answer this email and, you know, my mind's wandering somewhere else or I'm just physically exhausted because I'm, you know, barely sleeping these days looking after kids that are waking up in the middle of the night, right? So my training is less about building and and growth and more about maintaining, right? Maintaining, of course, my physicalness that I'm able to complete a squat and a deadlift and, you know, be strong and have the capacity to play with my kids and run around and those types of things. But then also to maintain my mental health, right? So it's all about maintenance for me in the gym. And maintenance does look like, you know, getting a bit of a pump and training a bit to failure and, you know, trying to go through a period of overload in a progressive fashion. So maintenance to me isn't about, um, you know, staying stagnant. Maintenance is about maintaining what I have. So Fletcher, to you, if you are feeling that you are a little bit, you know, time poor, you've got a few things going on and stuff stuff like that, think about that transition from always gunning for progression all the time to maintenance where we're maintaining, you know, what we have and appreciating what we have. And through that maintenance, we see, uh, you know, the the dividends that we, we put in into our investment. So over time, you know, I am getting stronger, you know, I am building a little bit more muscle, I am improving my fitness so I can maintain my health, maintain my mental health, even though I'm not gunning for, you know, the six pack or gunning for the three times body weight deadlift and those types of things yet, and that will come in time, but right now, all right, I'm in this phase of just maintaining what I have um, so that I can be the best version of myself. So Hopefully that bit of advice goes a long way for you, Fletcher, is that we always have time in fitness because right now, if you have a lot, lot of stuff going on, it's okay, it's okay, man. You know, tomorrow's going to come around and we're, we're on to the next day, right? Take it one day at a time um, because that's all we can really do. And you or we humans all want everything all at once, right? We all want to be able to have, um, you know, every phys- fitness aspect and look like a, a supermodel, but then also train like a strong man and, you know, look like a bodybuilder as well and run a marathon. All right, we all want those things. But, uh, you know, we need to remember that it, it, it does take time and we can have all those things if we want to put the effort in and the, the time investment for that. But I want to wrap it up there for episode number two of the Rise podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, let me know, this solo episode. Um, hopefully we have Coach Nick back next week that she isn't caught up again with some other other duties. Um, and hopefully come and see you guys joining us on the, the very first rise challenge, rise method challenge kicking off on the 12th of June. So not long now. See you then guys.